respond to personalized medicine and IPF. It's difficult to think about personalized treatment when we don't have great treatments yet. And yet, part of the reason we may not have great treatments is because we have not personalized them. And with that, I leave you, Embry North, from the University of Chicago, pretty soon to be a University of Virginia. <laughs> Uh, well, I too want to thank uh, Tim and Lisa for, for inviting me. They uh, sent me this very lofty title uh, by, by mail. Uh, and the uh, irony here is that a lot of what I'm going to talk about you actually heard yesterday by Jim Kiley. Uh, that puts me in a very enviable position because I get to build on uh, what he said uh, rather than introducing a whole lot of new concepts. Now, when you think about personalized medicine in general, what we really mean is about tailoring things to the patient. And it's an area where, if you think about it just broadly, uh, other disciplines have been doing this for a long time, right? This is the foundation of therapy in oncology, where we use molecular markers on tumors to decide which therapy works. And that's allowed us to engage in building blocks. Now, you know, ironically, as, as uh, Jesse just pointed out, there isn't a lot uh, that we have on the pulmonary fibrosis side, but we've actually been taking this approach now for a while. And I'm, uh, I'm simply going to build on what other speakers have already said. Um, so just uh, my disclosure is no relevant commercial interests uh, in relationship to this particular talk. I, I actually want to talk about a couple of things that popped up yesterday. Uh, Ganesh briefly, Dr. Raghu briefly mentioned the RAP trial and uh, mention was made of the cleanup trial by Phil Molyneux. And I'm going to show you their slides. I mean, well, at least it's the same figures. It's my slides, but they're, they're figures, right? So this is uh, data that we had published a few years ago in ERJ showing that patients with pulmonary fibrosis have a higher rate of sliding hiatal hernias, and that, that then predisposes you to reflux, and that the reflux association may, in fact, be treatable by treating the underlying uh, heartburn with uh, proton pump inhibitors, and when you do that, at least in retrospective data sets, that there might be improvements. Well, this is personalized medicine, right? So how was the RAP trial designed? We took patients, we put them, subjected them to pH probes to demonstrate that there was indeed increased acid, and then you are selecting in only that cohort to treat them. You're not treating everybody. And then there's a surgical RAP that's meant to prevent any of the juices from coming up which hopefully limits the injury. And uh, you know that trial will read out very, very shortly, and uh, we'll see just how much influence it, it has. It's conceptually very important because Andy showed you earlier, when he showed you the pathogenesis of this, if you think about the pathways involved in the disease, very simplistically, as we sit here and we live on the planet, we breathe. As we breathe, we inhale things. And so the lung is constantly subjected to injury of one kind or another. Now, whether that be acid, or viruses, or bacteria, or asbestosis, or any, any other thing that you'd like to invoke, there has to be a, re a injury and repair response, right? And so the epithelium takes that injury, uh, and then hopefully the repair is normal. And what we see in pulmonary fibrosis, of course, is that the, fib the, the repair process has kind of run a bit amok. So building on that, so there, there's the RAP trial, right? Can anisin fund application alter the disease progression in IPF patients with a positive pH probe? It was a randomized trial. So this is uh, what Phil showed you yesterday, right? Here's his data in the Blue Journal a few years ago that the patients with a higher bacterial load did poorer, right, than those without. And the subsequent data from uh, Melan Han and the Comet study, which I was an integral part of, uh, basically showed that uh, certain species, uh, staph and strep in particular, also correlated with at abundance levels that clearly uh, suggested poorer outcomes. And from that, uh, married to this particular trial, which had been published out of, the, out of the UK, that suggested there might be a benefit for the use of antibiotics. If you simply reduce the bacterial load, you reduce the injury, then you reduce the injury response. And from that was born cleanup. Uh, which is uh, a study of the clinical efficacy of antimicrobial therapy strategy using pragmatic design in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. It's a mouthful. Uh, where's Rex? I think that one was re your responsibility also, Rex. Uh, and the notion here is really very straightforward, right? Uh, can you, uh, we, we get this long title so we can come up with cleanup, right? So that everybody can remember that. But it's a large pragmatic design targeting 500 patients 
and we're ran randomizing them to an antibiotic versus no additional therapy. So there's no true placebo. It's a large pragmatic design. Uh, if they are randomized to the antibiotic, it's either Bactrim, and if they're allergic to Bactrim, it's doxycycline, with very practical clinical outcome measures and a minimalistic approach. But here's where it needs to be personalized, right? And we're checking swabs of the oropharynx to see if we can personalize it in the future. It's important to realize that only 40% had an increased bacterial load. So 60% may not actually be the right cohort in the study, and we'll find out as we conduct the study. So it could be personalized to that group as well. And one of the major keys for this, you'll see moving forward why we did it this way, everybody's getting blood co collected for their underlying genetics. It's the first time in any study that I've ever known of where it's being required, okay? IRBs came after us and said, you can't require it, it has to be voluntary, and our answer was, don't enroll them. You want in, it's included. Because I'm gonna get on my pulpit for just a second, you would never do a breast cancer trial without knowing someone's breast, uh, BRAC1 status. Wouldn't happen, right? Can't happen, shouldn't happen, and it needs to change. This has gotta be a philosophical, cultural change for us as we move forward to incorporate genetics in the future. And so this was a major step that we took in that direction in this trial. All right, so what is precision personalized medicine? It's an emerging approach for disease treatment and prevention that takes into account an individual's variability in genes, right? Basically the environment, I just showed you environmental issues, treatments, that would be the antibiotics, and, and their genes. And so we can discover mechanisms and targets involved. We can establish predictive value based on these kind of things, and you've seen a ton of data on that. I'm gonna show you a quick slide on telomeres because you've heard so much about it uh, the last few days. But the point is, telomeres uh, and, and other markers help us segregate patients into those that are gonna progress versus non-progress. Uh, our 52 gene signature was, was shown over the last couple of days as another marker that you could draw on the blood and simply delineate a group that's gonna move faster and a group that's gonna move slower, okay? Prognostic value, that's what we're just talking about. And then really what we're shooting for is a pharmacogenetics evaluation. And that is the ultimate, right? So when you decide on, on breast cancer treatment, you take those markers and you decide on that treatment based on those markers, which is the underlying genetic characteristics of that patient. So here's, you know, just to, to show you that you can obviously predict based on underlying genetics. This is the telomer length that uh, Christine Garcia published a few years ago using our, uh, collaborating with us and with UCSF. And you can clearly separate it out into the quartiles to figure out where patients are gonna go. So just an example of that. Now, the next few slides uh, deserve special mention. Uh, these are Justin Oldham's slides from a few years ago at ATS uh, and really kind of outline where we went as a group, and I want to give him credit for that because this is what you're seeing here is, is very much his brainchild. So there were two genome-wide association studies that were published a few years ago within 24 hours of each other, uh, ours in Lancet Res Respiratory Medicine and um, David Schwartz's group in uh, Nature Genetics, and the follow-up survival data was actually out of, um, out of David's group looking at the MUC5. And so what we learned from that was that when you identify the susceptibility genes in some of these cases, that it does correlate with the disease activity. Now, interestingly enough, in both cases, it was inverse to what we thought it would be, right? So if you have the MUC5 polymorphism, which is in 10% of the populace in general, and 40 to 60% of IPF patients, you actually have a better prognosis. And the same was true for the toll interactive protein gene that we isolated. Uh, which show that same kind of relationship. But their activities are very, very different. The MUC5 is a um, mucin gene, and toll interactive protein is a critical rheostat regulator. It controls the dimming on the lights, right, of the immune response to that injury, okay? And so, you know, how can this information be used? Can you enrich for events? In other words, can you pre-select patients that are gonna progress? That's one way to use it, right? It's easier to show if a drug's effective if you simply have more events. Can you stratify an analysis? Well, I just showed you that actually in cleanup, boy, that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take a look at the underlying genetics and the swabs for the bacterial. And so you can, at least in the retrospective end of it, figure out if there was a group that responded better or worse. And can you ultimately use it for cohort selection, the BRAC1? Who are you gonna treat? And so, I'm gonna skip that again. You guys all know about the panther trial, right? So one of the problems with the PANTHER trial was we made it voluntary to collect for DNA, and about half of the patients collected. And the trial was stopped in the prednisone azathioprine arm because the interim analysis showed that it was quite deadly, right? Real deadly. 
If it, there's one major thing we did in the field in the last 10 years that improved outcomes, it was stopping this, right? And then we resumed the trial with NAC versus placebo alone because everybody anecdotally said we were seeing something with the NAC, okay? And we couldn't figure out what or why. So here was the design. We had those three arms. And this was the results of that first part. Hazard ratio, right? It was eight deaths versus one. Hazard ratio works out to, to 11. All right, so you were 11 times more likely to die if you got Predi's and NAC. But here's the NAC alone versus placebo. And the most important part here, if I can get that laser pointer again, is it looked like it was favoring things at first, and then it just flattened out. And everybody said, gee, did you enroll different patients on the second half than you did on the first? So we asked that question, and I'm going to show you some of that data, okay? So in a candidate approach, we had, uh, since we were focused on total interactive protein and the chromosome 11 region, we selected some of the polymorphisms that were regulatory in nature or functional in nature in the gene to see if there was a difference that was actually genetic between when we enrolled the patients the first time and when we enrolled them after the break, okay? And don't get hung up on the numbers. The bottom line here is we have a few that are in the promoter region. We've got this exonic SNP, and then we've got a few in the microRNA binding site. And so we picked five genes based on which ones were not repeating each other because it turns out that one gene in one location can be completely reflective of what's going on in the other location. You don't need to test them both. Both They give you the same information. And so the genotype and count and frequencies were compared using a chi-squared and Fisher's exact test. And then we looked at the drug gene interaction and used a multivariable Cox regression model and used a, a p-value of 0.01 for the interaction uh, based on the von Peroni correction and a composite endpoint of deaths, hospitalizations, transplant, and decline in FVC, okay? And based on the SNP distribution, we used an additive model for Tollup, and uh, we're using dominant models in all the other SNPs. And this is what the data looks like, just to give you a, a sense of the size of the data. I wish it were larger, I wish it was the whole set. This is why we should never be moving forward without doing, doing it across the board. Because the first criticism was, well, are you sure it's equal across the board? And so we had 54 in the placebo arm, 60 in the NAC arm, and 40 in the prednisone azathioprine arm, giving us uh, a split in the pre and post. There were no differences statistically the pre and post, but there were visual differences you could see. And this is where it was hard to tell apart, right? Between the genotype patients and the non-genotype patients, 154 versus 161, absolutely no difference in the demographic characteristics. They were the same age, same distribution of males to females, same level of disease severity, same composite endpoint distributions, across the board. Why am I showing you that? To point out that what we had genotyped and what we didn't have genotyped were the same types of patients, okay? And sure enough, when you look at the genotypes, you can see what the kind of distributions that we were expecting given the polymorphisms, and they were even across the board, but it's missing data that we don't have in this group. And when we looked at the interaction results, lo and behold, this particular polymorphism in the third exon of Tollup passed significance and quite strongly, okay? We had two others that were pretty darn close. Uh, another one in the promoter region and in the MUC5 polymorphism, but they didn't pass statistical significance. What did it look like? And this is why it ran flat. So if you were a homozygote major, okay, NAC was harmful. How harmful? Hazard ratio here, 3.23, p-value 0.1. If you were heterozygote, neutral, right? No difference. And if you were homozygote minor, the hazard ratio was 0.14. Let me reverse that for you. That's a hazard ratio of 7. So you were dramatically beneficial in the patients who had this particular polymorphism. How many have this polymorphism? I joke the genius of this particular exercise happened to be a good fortune in regards to this particular SNP. It's 25%, 50%, 25%. Let me explain what this actually means to all of you who are not necessarily in the field. Blue eyes versus brown eyes. These are common polymorphisms. Blue eyes are not abnormal. They are minor. Okay? To have blue eyes, mom and dad each have to have given you a blue eye, right? Blue eye gene. If you are 
homozygote major, and you got two, one from mom and one from dad, this is where you're going to be. If you got one each, this is where you're going to be. And if you're on the minor side, this is where you're going to be. Okay? Not abnormal, this is just a variant that's in the, common in the public. So the major criticism for this kind of work is can you repeat it? Does it hold up again? Is it just fluke chance when you're testing for this kind of thing? So we pulled out the old interimmune data set from the gamma interferon, uh, gamma interferon set and had an overlap of roughly the same number of patients in it when we combined it with the U of C, University of Chicago cohort. So there were 314 patients in the Inspire set, 91 in the Chicago set. Again, not a whole lot of differences uh, other than who got treated with what, uh, mostly because one was in a trial and the other wasn't. The Chicago set was sicker. That's the statistical significance in here. And the genetic distribution was pretty even between the two. So most importantly, at a genetic level, the two cohorts uh, meshed. And only that Tollop SNP passed the von Ferroni correction. And it had very similar hazard ratios again. Again, the hazard ratio for benefit was 0.23 with a p-value of 0.04, and for harm was 3.1. So when you look at something that's harmful on one group of patients and helpful on the other, it's going to look flat across the board. And so really the focus has got to be to treat just the group that's going to benefit. So NAC may be effective in one out of four patients, right? And it was the first time that we've ever demonstrated, well, we only, only had therapies for a couple of years. But here we were demonstrating that we might have a potential third therapy that may only be beneficial in one in four patients. One in four patients isn't bad, particularly given the profile of the drug, because we can add it, right? So there were no clinical trait differences between the groups that were genotyped and not, and no genetic differences in the treatment arms or the enrollment period. And we were able to actually replicate the effect in this particular polymorphism. And that's why we've taken this universal approach in cleanup. So where's the future? In my last couple of minutes, where's the future? So we are currently working with the NIH to put a proposal together called Precisions, Prospective Treatment Efficacy in IPF Using Genotype for NAC Selection. In other words, can we prove this prospectively? And if we did, this would clearly be a game changer in how we approach treating patients by selecting the cohort of patients that would get this kind of treatment, right? And so the design is actually fundamentally very straightforward, right? The hypothesis is that those with this genotype will exhibit an improved clinical outcomes when treated with NAC. Double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled trial, we want 200 patients split 100 in each arm to receive NAC, but only those with this particular polymorphism. They can be on a background therapy. Why? Am I not worried about reducing the FEC decline? Will that not re reduce the efficacy? I forgot to mention, the key part of the signal in the original discovery data set was hospitalizations. It was a reduction in hospitalizations. And this makes some sense given the mechanism of action of where this is located, given that it would be reducing the inflammatory response right at the injury. Okay? But when we tested it in the second data set, we didn't have hospitalization data. And so it was the FVC decline that held up. It tells you that each part of the composite endpoint is actually a contributor to the overall measure. And it's very reassuring. So we've selected a primary endpoint of categorical decline in the FVC or DLCO. First time to respiratory non-elective hospitalization, transplant, or death. And the idea is this very robust one-to-one -one randomization design. Inclusion-exclusion, diagnosis of IPF. Clearly, you've got to have the right genotype. Allow for all the concomitant medications. But here's the rub. I got to screen somewhere between 800 to 1,000 patients to find those 200, right? Natalia, you're in the front row. Can you think of any trial that's done 1,000 patients? Huh? All the cardiology trials, exactly. Right? So this is where I got to give uh, credit to Flaherty. Where's Flaherty? He's missing in action. Kevin Flaherty had a brilliant idea, and it's to credit all of you. It's to put the PFF at the center of this. Okay? So this would be among the largest screening efforts in IPF history. How do you accomplish this? Partnering with the PFF. We have a biorepository where patients have given their blood for DNA with consent to be contacted back to see if they're interested in enrolling. So the notion is to pull the, the blood out of there, screen it all at once, and inverse 
the classic enrollment of clinical trials by screening it all at once and then going backwards to the patients all at once and saying, are you interested or not? And with 1,000 in the registry, we can start on day one to really have a very high ramp and move this at a very accelerated pace. So the biorepository allows us to genotype uh, in a de-identified manner. By partnering with the CCN sites, we would return that de-identified information to the sites. We at the center would not know, right? And then the individual sites would be pre-armed with that knowledge and can approach the patients one by one and see if they choose to enroll or not. The expectation of this approach is that it'll invert that typical ramp up enrollment process with rapid enrollment early. So I think, I hope that this is an example of where things can go down the road. Whether this succeeds or not as a, a successful therapy remains to be seen. But I think it's where the field needs to go and why we need to have all that information with each and every trial that we do. And so this is just a figure of how it would look at the end of the day, PFF partnership to get that thousand patients out of the biorepository so that we can pick up the prevalent cases and then we would look for additional incident cases if we don't achieve our uh, goal off the get-go to get that one-to-one -one randomization in a double-blind fashion. And with that, I want to thank um, all the people at the University of Chicago who, uh, you know, helped me with the uh, GWAS work originally and, and the biology work that we've had there, the PFF C uh, CCN with uh, Kevin Flaherty and, and Greg Cosgrove's support uh, of the trial. Um, we're currently working with Kathy Spino at Michigan on the design with uh, Kevin Anstrom's input. Uh, certainly Justin, who was the brainchild behind uh, the, the pharmacogenetics, um, and uh, uh, input from Ganesh and, and David Schwartz in the original paper. And with that, I'll stop.